You're listening to the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast, a place for sex addicts to share their experiences of recovery, to help break the stigma, myths, and misconceptions of sex addiction. This podcast may contain topics of sexuality, sexual trauma, dysfunction, or other things that may be triggering. So listener discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast. My name is Jason, I'm a sex addict, and I will be your podcast host for today. Hey, what's going on everyone? Welcome to episode number 99 of the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast. This week I have recurring friend of the pod, MJ, as a guest for this episode. MJ was hopefully going to join us on the 100th episode, but he had other obligations and couldn't make that. And so it was just fitting that he was able to make this recording. I didn't have anyone scheduled for this week, and it worked out perfectly for both of us. MJ is my sponsee, and he has been on several episodes of the podcast, starting on episode four with the three circles and episode six, which covered the first year of recovery. I had him back on episode 18 to talk about the TV show Lost and how it related to our recovery And then on episode 58, he shared his experience, strength, and hope, and talked a lot about the PTSD that he had suffered. Both in the last episode and in episode 58, we talked about writing, and one of his goals was to become a writer for TV shows and movies. So that does factor into our conversation this week. Just recently, with the WGA Writers Guild of America writer's strike that is happening, A lot of that does deal with what we talked about in this episode around the Hollywood industry and executives, power issues, and we did relate that to the hashtag MeToo movement. There was recently an article in Vanity Fair that I read that did talk about the toxic environment behind the scenes on the TV show Lost, and that article was by Mo Ryan or Maureen Ryan. I also referenced her book, and I will be talking about that more after the episode is over. But because of the nature of outside causes and issues, we really try to focus it more on the sex-addictive type of behaviors that were being displayed in the book and in the article. A lot of what had to do with the toxic environment on Lost surrounded racism. We did cover that a little bit, but we did try to focus it more on the sexism and sexually abusive actions that were happening. So again, I'll be talking about that at the end of this episode. One of the things that was really cool about our conversation is we didn't have an entire map of what we were going to talk about. And so the conversation just kind of flowed naturally. And early on, we got into the step work that we're doing. I am just about to give him some instructions on working step 10. One of those that I mentioned in the conversation was reading step 10 out of the 12 and 12 for 30 days in a row. And if you miss a day, start over. And it is such a wonderful exercise. And so I did want to read a couple of selections from Step 10 in 12 Steps and 12 Traditions. I don't usually read from that on the podcast and wanted to make sure that I did. And the reading selections can be found from pages 88 to 95. And I've got three selections that I'm going to be reading. The first is the first couple of paragraphs, and I will read the step. Step 10, continued to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. As we work the first nine steps, we prepare ourselves for the adventure of a new life. But when we approach step 10, we commence to put our AA way of living to practical use, day by day, in fair weather or foul. Then comes the acid test. Can we stay sober, keep in emotional balance, and live to good purpose under all conditions? A continuous look at our assets and liabilities and a real desire to learn and grow by this means are necessities for us. We alcoholics have learned this the hard way. More experienced people, of course, in all times and places have practiced unsparing self-survey and criticism. 
For the wise have always known that no one can make much of his life until self-searching becomes a regular habit, until he is able to admit and accept what he finds, and until he patiently and persistently tries to correct what is wrong. So that was on page 88, and I'm going to be skipping down on page 89. Although all inventories are alike in principle, the time factor does distinguish one from another. There is the spot check inventory, taken at any time of the day, whenever we find ourselves getting tangled up. There is the one that we take at day's end, when we review the happenings of the hours just past. Here we cast up a balance sheet, crediting ourselves with things well done, and chalking up debits were due. Then there are those occasions when alone or in the company of our sponsor or spiritual advisor, we make a careful review of our progress since the last time. Many AAs go in for annual or semi-annual house cleanings. Many of us also like the experience of an occasional retreat from the outside world where we can quiet down for an undisturbed day or so of self-overhaul and meditation. And then I wanted to skip down to page 93. When evening comes, perhaps just before going to sleep, many of us draw up a balance sheet for the day. This is a good place to remember that inventory taking is not always done in red ink. It's a poor day indeed when we haven't done something right. As a matter of fact, the waking hours are usually well filled with things that are constructive. Good intentions, good thoughts, and good acts are there for us to see. Even when we have tried hard and failed, we chalk that up as one of the greatest credits of all. Under these conditions, the pains of failure are converted into assets. Out of some of them, we receive the stimulation we need to go forward. Someone who knew what he was talking about once remarked that pain was the touchstone of all spiritual progress. So yeah, I wanted to read a little bit of step 10 there. Like I mentioned, we do cover some step work at the beginning and a lot about meditation in step 11. And then our conversation does shift into various things. And like I mentioned, I tried to keep the conversation around TV shows and films and writing relating to the article and book that Mo Ryan had written. Uh, focus more on sexually addictive and abusive behaviors being talked about so we're not straying too far into outside causes and issues. Like I mentioned in the conversation that in a workshop I did in 2019, I did ask several other people if they thought that toxic behavior and the hashtag MeToo movement should be included in our conversations on the podcast and they a lot of people said yes that did seem to lead to productive conversation so after the conversation is over i'll be reading a lot of listener feedback and playing some music some of it very recovery related coming from our listeners and some of it relating to what mj and i talked about in our conversation and before turning it over to the conversation i did want to preface that MJ was taking his newborn out for a walk in uh, this warm, sunny Californian day. So it was awesome that I had this chance to have this conversation while he was getting some exercise and connecting with his daughter. Uh, his daughter is young enough where she's not understanding the context of the conversation that we're having. So if uh, anyone was worried about that. But it was such a fun, fun conversation, and I'm now ready to turn it over to that. Here it is. I hope you enjoy it. I like that shot behind me, though, that white into blue. That's cool. Yeah. Very peaceful. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, so do you have a topic idea? Absolutely not. <laughs> okay. I thought of a couple. Sure. One was how other addictions find their way into our fellowship or how okay. sex. And I don't know if you've done it. I haven't listened to all 100. I'm, I'm pretty good about it, but I haven't listened to all of them. So I don't know if you've done one on that. And we could also do one on if there's any TV show or film or series of films you wanted to talk about. We could do one on that. Didn't we have an idea? Before? Yeah. Yeah, one of them was Russian Doll. 
old Russian doll. Yeah, that yeah, was very good. Yeah, it's been a while since I've watched it. So, right. I just watched a sumo show called Sanctuary that was very good. Cool. And I've been thinking a lot about that process, like martial arts, like the mm-hmm. process by which we become what we're going to be, you know? Oh, neat. Yeah. Like the whole show was about how this guy was real arrogant and all that. And this is like the every samurai movie or show. Yeah. He was, yeah. yeah. And he was real arrogant and self centered. And then throughout the show, he became a sumo and he gained the respect. And then it ended where you didn't know if he won or not because it was about the process. Mm, neat. Yeah. So that process of becoming is kind of cool. Yeah, we can definitely talk about that. And one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on tonight, twofold. Number one, you couldn't make the recording for next week, which we're doing the 100th episode. And I've opened up that link to a number of people at meetings and I posted the information up on the website. So I'm not sure who's going to show, but yeah, I don't have anything particularly planned for that one. And then just thinking about it this week, last week I did the episode on throat singing and that was on uh, episode 98 and that took a long time to edit. And in (laughs) that, that uh, editing process, I was hoping to line up someone as a guest for this week and realizing that I didn't, I'm just like, yeah, I'll, I'll do a short episode on reading listener feedback because I've gotten quite a few emails over the past few weeks that I haven't been able to read on the podcast. And mm-hmm. uh, when you mentioned the other day at the noon meeting that uh, you couldn't make the 100th episode, it's like, dude come on this week. And so always welcome on the podcast. Thanks, MJ. (laughs) I appreciate you saying that because I feel like a friend of the show, like uh, Conan O'Brien TV comes up every time Uh I turn my TV on, it goes to this like weird Samsung TV free channel listing. And it's just a replay of Conan through the years. And he'll have on these same guests like Aubrey Plaza. And yeah, yeah. I just thought about how certain people become friends of the show. Yeah. You know, and his assistant is also a friend of the show and she's Albanian and she has a big following in Albania. Anyway, so as your sponsee, <laughs> thinking I may have become a friend of the show now. Yeah, just, totally. That just lifts my heart. <laughs> yeah, you're on episode four, you know, right yep. there at the beginning. So the first three I recorded in 2019 and then... Mm-hmm. um four onwards were post pandemic and on zoom. And so, yeah, you were right there at the beginning and I forget which other episode early on, but one of the first couple right after episode four, episode four was on the three circles. And I can't remember Mm -hmm. if it was um, six or seven, roughly right around there that you were on. The reason why we're talking about TV shows and stuff is we did episode 18 on lost right i do want to talk about that in just a minute but right in the 50s i think it was like 58 59 i can't remember exactly Mm -hmm. had you back on Mm -hmm. and that episode i got a lot of really great feedback uh, via email people talking about the ptsd that you talked about there Uh, Mm -hmm. we also talked about ogling and the three second rule and um, mm-hmm. things like that there. So that was awesome. And so, yeah, uh, anytime that you've been able to jump on, it's been, been fantastic. Well, we seem to have a good pace now of about every 30 or 40 episodes. <laughs> I hop on, <Yeah. laughs> which is great. It's just enough. So they don't, you know, they don't get sick of me, but I just keep popping up. Yeah. <laughs> I get texts about that one in the fifties too. I get yeah. texts about that. Yeah, I've been grateful that you've been receptive to answering people after hearing that one. Because you had a lot of great information there. You know, we've worked together a while now. Yeah, yeah. That's a very long-running sponsorship relationship. And yeah, 
I try to respect that. And I know how much you do. So I don't use you unless it's serious. And I think for your part, what's so cool about that, and we never talked about it, but what was so cool about that is you seem to now know <laughs> when I'm calling or texting you, you're like, let's okay. do this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> You get up? right with me. Yep. What's going on? <laughs> yeah. And so I really appreciate that. And uh, we have a real good from my side, I just think you're the best sponsor, and we have such a good dynamic. Yeah, yeah, totally. I definitely agree with that. And I know that recently we're right in that transition between step nine and step 10. 10. And mm-hmm. Yeah, so with 10, I've got a task for you to, to do something that you know, I haven't talked to you about yet, but uh, something that my sponsor had me do and that I've done with my sponsees is have them read step 10 out of the 12 and 12. Oh, every, cool. Every day for 30 days in a row. Uh-huh. So if, okay. you, if you miss a day, you got to start over. So. Oh, it, wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's a fun exercise. Okay. Here, yeah. T- challenge accepted. Yeah. I will start tomorrow. Yeah. So one of the things that, that really enabled me to get into was a daily routine and Mm -hmm. doing a daily inventory. And when I missed my reading, it's just like, Oh yeah, I didn't do step 10 for today, which doing this reading is part of. So I have talked about it on the podcast. Some of the other journaling that I do around step 10, I've changed it up from, from time to time. And there've been different types of step 10 inventories, but typically I look at, you know, some of the good things that happened during the day and some of the things that could have gone better and looking at some of the resentments and fears that come up and character defects that come up, but also looking at gratitudes. And like right now, as you're taking a walk on this conversation, Mm -hmm. I have gratitude for seeing all the trees that are behind you in the, uh, The way the sunlight is bouncing is really a beautiful thing. So I can Mm -hmm. put something like that down in in my gratitude list is doing a a daily 10th step. We often focus on all the bad shit that happened today and Mm -hmm. all the character defects. And I like to balance it out with some good things, some bad things and move forward and use the previous nine steps on a daily basis. Mm. That's great. That's great. I appreciate that. My spirit is just like that shot right now. That, and when I say shot, I just mean the visual of me yeah. walking. Yeah. And so that's, yeah, that's where my spirit is. Now, if, if you want, this jumps ahead a step, but I could also tell, and I don't know, because some of it's outside issue stuff, but I could talk about it without that. But my step 11 is actually pretty wild. Mm -hmm. How I came to daily meditation and all the different religious and spiritual things I tried. Mm -hmm. So if you want, I could tell that I could do it pretty quickly, you know, but if you want. Yeah, definitely. And one of the things with the later steps for me with step nine, that uh, wasn't really completed for years. And so... Mm -hmm. I was working on nine and it was making amends wherever possible. And some, Mm -hmm. some of those came up years after I had actually worked the step, but looking at the end of nine, 10, 11, and 12, there's no like real clear delineation. You can Mm -hmm. start working on step 11 with prayer and meditation while you're still working on step 10 as the, you know, the daily inventory and doing that 30 day process that I mentioned. So yeah. Yeah. If you, yeah. If you want to talk about your meditation practice you go for it. Okay, cool. And I feel like the process of this podcast, and I don't know what, whatever you use or don't use, you're the, you're the maestro here. But what's interesting is we didn't have a topic yet. We're being carried along by the HP very well. Yeah. Here by, yeah. <laughs> and so, okay. So it started for me in 2002 in Minneapolis. There's actually a large Zen community. Mm -hmm. And so what happened was there was this kid who had moved from LA with his best friend just to practice Zen at this place. Okay. And he, 
he, he was militant about it, but then he got he got into meth. And so finally he ended up in treatment and he was with me in this treatment center and I was in this treatment center, Jason, this place was, it was a rough treatment center. Now he Mm -hmm. couldn't leave. This was a state funded place on the VA grounds. And it was this old abandoned hospital building with like wires hanging. I don't know how it was insured. And he couldn't leave to go to his meditation on the weekends, which was very early in the morning. Mm -hmm. And less he got someone to come with him. I don't know how, but he convinced me to go along with him. And I went and sat there for 40 minutes. It's total silence. You just sit there. And I thought, oh, geez. And it was actually really cool and really relieving. And I felt very much at home right away. Then (laughs) later on, fast forward about 10 years, is it okay if I talk about different religious organizations in this? Oh, or yeah. No? yeah. Okay, cool, cool. Because there's like five of them that come up. So I was actually working for the church I grew up with. I didn't have a job. And I went there for my grandma's funeral. And then they hired me to be their education person. So anyway, uh, I started doing, I tried any way I could to make it kind of not Christian. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so I started a meditation thing there. And they let me do it. And we did it once a week, and it was pretty cool, and people could do it however they wanted. In the interim, I also had started a yoga practice, which I've since ceased doing. But mm-hmm. So I, I did that, and then I ran away from the Presbyterian church because they wouldn't allow gay people to be married in the church yet. Oh, and it wow. was pissing, yeah. yeah, it was pissing me off how slow they would be. And so I said, well, screw you guys. And I quit and left. And uh, I haven't been back, even though now they, most of them allow it. But anyway. yeah. yeah. Uh, and I started going to the Quakers. <laughs> yeah. Now yeah. at this time I was acting out deeply. I was deeply in my addiction, but I would wake up on Sunday mornings. I had the desire for spirituality It's just I wasn't able to maintain, you know, the 10th and 11th steps. It's all about what's going on right now. And there was just a dichotomy there between what I was able to do with my body and what I wanted to do with my spirit, which is Mm -hmm. the age old question. You know, that's the age old problem. We have lofty ambitions and the body's weak or whatever. So anyway, I would wake up after acting out for And I would wake up and go to this Quaker service and the Quakers just sit there silently for an hour Uh and they only speak up when someone talks. So I liked that. But then I left there and in 2015, I moved to Los Angeles. Now, my acting out was crazy at this time, but this is also where my daily meditation practice starts. And here's how it started. I was in an acting class and a, a very professional one. Uh, This guy named Howard Fine, who's one of the great acting teachers. Now, if you know about acting, do you have any experience with acting or acting, teaching or anything like that by chance? I do not. Jay? Cool, cool. Well, there are these books like An Actor Prepares by Stanislavski, uh, which are kind of famous. And there's another one by Meisner, I think, is another one. And then there's a woman who wrote one. Oh, my God, I read it and I can't remember. It's not Stella Adler. There's another woman who wrote one and I can't remember her name, but damn it, it's okay. So he was in all the school of those guys, the uh, method school. And he had written a book, Howard Fine had, and I wanted to take his class when I got to L.A. so I could learn method acting. You know, Mm -hmm. I'd always looked up to Marlon Brando and all these people. Yeah, yeah. And in method acting, your breath is unbelievably important. Okay, and he gave us this breath exercise where we were supposed to sit and basically do nothing. And it was so much like meditation that what I did is I went and did it out in the streets of L.A. I was actually on Santa Monica Boulevard (laughs) at night and I just stood there for half an hour. And then I got to thinking about this and I thought, okay, what can I do? Like, has this been done before? And of course, it had Taoist, the Tao. So T A O I S T, the Tao, mm-hmm. those 
they there's the, they got those famous 81 poems or koans or the famous 81 poems that are often translated into English. Well, they used to have these Kung Fu guys who would train these Taoist Kung Fu monks. And if you look it up online, they would train in standing meditation. Oh, they wow. wouldn't. Yeah, they didn't move. All they did was stand still for incredibly long periods of time. And if you Google it, you'll see it right away. Like Taoist standing meditation. And these guys were bad ass. They were tough. And they stood with their hands in a circle out in front of them and their fingers barely touching. So I got into this and I started standing. Now, I was also struggling at that time because I was an actor and I wasn't getting any success. And I was also a writer and wasn't getting any success. And so I got really into this and I went out onto Santa Monica Boulevard every night in 2015 and stood there and did Taoist meditation <laughs> in the <laughs> for for like and I got up to where I was doing it for an hour. Jeez. And then people, yeah, people started to notice me. And this one couple came up when I was on a date and they wanted to do it with me. And they said, can we talk to you? And I said, well, no one's asked before, but I guess it's fine as long as I don't move. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I chatted with them and then they came back the next night and wanted to meditate again. That's nice. And, yeah. So anyway, I started thinking about it, though, and I want to take this further than being performative. So I want to become an actual meditator. So I, I stopped doing it on Santa Monica Boulevard and started doing standing meditation in my own room. And then after a while, this gets so strenuous. I was in the best shape of my life doing this. It was better shape than I was when I was in the Marines. I mean, it's really hard doing this. You'd get drenched in sweat. And I started doing sitting meditation. I looked it up and the Burmese people, because mm -hmm. I, the Burmese people, because I was never flexible enough to do it without, um, to do like that thing, the lotus. I was never flexible enough, but the Burmese people must have had inflexible hips like mine because they came up with a way. It kind of goes from a triangle from your belly button to your two knees mm -hmm. and then your feet just lay there. If you Google that, you see the same thing. And so I started doing that and that was it for me. And I've done that now every day. I've missed about, I don't know, 10 days in the last, what has it been now? Eight years I've done. Wow. It. And Dang. Some days I even, yeah, some days I even do it twice. And what happens is the only time in my day when I'm just completely in the moment. Yeah. And a thought will pop up. The thoughts are our brains, our thought factories, Jason. The thoughts aren't going anywhere. But when the thoughts pop up, I just let them go. And then after a while, you get really good at letting them go. But that's just by focusing on the breath in and out. In and yeah. Out. And yeah. One of the reasons we named our daughter Kai for the ocean is it starts to feel, and I relate deeply with each crashing wave on a beach, you know, because I do think of our consciousness as that, as us, when we're completely and fully conscious as you and I are now, sitting on the edge of this enormous ocean that is actually underneath the surface of our mind. Mm -hmm. And it's so peaceful there and such a gift to be there. So that's my 11th step journey. Oh, and I forgot, I forgot about the cult in Kansas, but they're not really a cult. They're actually really nice to me and I don't want to say anything bad about them. So they were really nice to me. So I don't want to include them in this whole thing. <laughs> okay. Uh, I was in a cult adjacent kind of thing, but not like, you know, I mean, my first sponsor in Narcotics Anonymous said, I said to him, this is a religion. And he said, it is not. And I said, we're meeting. We say these chants and all this. And he said, he looked at me finally. He was this angry motorcycle guy. And he said, call it a cult if you want, but don't call it a fucking religion. <laughs> 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 so so we're a little bit cultish and, and that's okay. But anyway, just like us, they were kind of cult adjacent, but friendly. And I used to go sit with them and do these hour long meditations. And then they would say, you can make a love offering. and I think they were asking for money, but who knows? Anyway, that's my 11 step journey, Jason. I hope I didn't go off too long there. No, that, that was brilliant. 
I'm very interested in checking out the standing meditation. Yeah, I mm-hmm. don't think I would be very good at that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As we've been talking about, you know, martial arts films. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, being a wrestler growing up, I still like martial arts. And I even like, uh, you know, the UFC and all that because I'm just interested. I know there's a lot of negatives to it, but from a positive aspect, I think it's just such a great metaphor for becoming who we want to be. Mm-hmm. And and the process of becoming and like and the thing is with martial arts is there's so many different disciplines and then you have to square that or maybe even cube that to get all the different training methods for those disciplines. Yeah. And to think because it's just so simple, but to think that these Taoist monks were practicing basically Kung Fu, I believe. I think it says on there that they were, but I could be wrong. And if someone out there is, knows, I'm sorry. But they're when you look online, they are martial artists, and all they do, their only training is standing there, and that's just so brilliant. It's like, why did anyone think of that? Because after a while, the weight of your own body is just brutal, but you do get to a very meditative place. Yeah. Anyway. There's similar things in music, like, I don't know if it's analogous, but who is the guitarist for Rage Against the Machine? Tom um, Morello. Yeah, Tom Morello, you know, and he has a cool show with his mom now. Shout out to Tom Morello. But anyway, that he used to practice for eight hours a day, you know, just mm-hmm. practice the same, just like an athlete. And I don't think it matters exactly what you're practicing, but to get to that deep meditative state where you're just not so hyper conscious of yourself as we are often that's Mm -hmm. such a part of our addiction isn't it wouldn't you say yeah yeah and just thinking of tom morello and playing guitar Mm -hmm. i talk about playing guitar as a meditation for me i get to Mm -hmm. a point where i lose myself in whatever i'm doing and just Mm -hmm. i'm lost in the moment and um what i'm doing guitar videos that's different because i can become hypercritical and then Mm. start making more and more mistakes and when i'm not doing that i'm just like i don't care about the mistakes i'm enjoying the moment of playing whether or not i do screw up on a song it's just being present and also allowing that music to take me to another level of consciousness it's something that's kind of hard to describe but it's uh it's really brilliant when that happens i just kind of lose myself in it well and i brought up tom morello knowing that you're a guitarist and i Mm -hmm. did want to because i'll say this you know you're being critical of yourself there but when i would watch i'm not on facebook anymore but when i would watch those guitar videos you posted you did have a look on your face that is this look it's the unconsciousness of the self and of what you're just pure action, you know, mm-hmm. know, and of course you're in deep enjoyment, though enjoyment it's deeper than enjoyment, isn't it? You mm-hmm. probably described it better than I'm, I'm bastardizing what you just said really <laughs> well. So I'm sorry. It's a lot of fun. When I become hypercritical is when I am having to do a song on the 10th take or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's just like, I'll nail the song except for this one part. And then, it's like, why can't I get that right? What in? Oh, wait, here it comes, here it comes, and I screwed it up again. <laughs> and so, like, when I'm not thinking about trying to do it right, I usually end up just floating by. And like I said, being in the moment. Absolutely. I love that. Because all of our favorite works of art in any medium are going to be flawed, but we don't care. Mm-hmm. We don't give a shit at that point. It's the thing we love. I was just talking to someone about Silence of the Lambs mm-hmm. and explaining what I felt to be an amazing atypical love story. I thought it was misread and people focused on an anti-trans message from Buffalo Bill. But I thought there was such an amazing queer love story and atypical and aromantic love story happening between Clarice and Hannibal there. Yeah, And so I was just talking to a friend of mine and I was saying that the love story is what matters between those two. 
we don't care. The movie's not famous because it's a mis- It's not a mystery. We know basically who's doing it, and mm-hmm. it's the mystery almost makes no sense. So everything is flawed, but that doesn't matter. It's not about that. It's about the mess. If we can get out of our minds, I don't know. I've just, now I'm getting hypercritical of myself. I'm going <laughs> to yeah, shut just, up. Yeah, just thinking about <laughs> Silence of the Lambs and the love story there. Uh, I'm a huge, huge fan of the TV show Hannibal, and so yes. that has uh will graham and hannibal Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. there's just the love story between these two men Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. it's so awesome to see that over a number of seasons and the recognition of this is not about you know catching a killer (laughs) there's a lot more deeper levels uh, to that and i just love that show Yes. If you want to talk about levels, we've circled back to our favorite topic, potentially. Lost. Yeah. 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 So thinking of flawed, Mm -hmm. the article that came out in Vanity Fair, you and I were talking about that recently. Um, Mm -hmm. I actually have the book and was reading it uh, today by um, Maureen Ryan called uh, Burn It Down. And Mm -hmm. it's about Hollywood writing and TV shows and movies and just the number of flawed things that, that happened. The TV show lost, I still appreciate, but hearing some of the stories from the actors and writers on the show, a number of writers who had to leave because of the toxic environment. Um, oh. those things, yeah. Those things were not really present while watching the show. And yes, Years later, you know, they they come out and talk about the sexism and racism that is there, and I, I don't want to get too far into that because it could stray into um, outside issues. But the Vanity Fair article was such an interesting read that it made me want to get the book, and the book does talk a lot about the hashtag Me Too stuff, and yes. In my workshop that happened before I started this podcast, I I asked the group if they thought that those things were relevant to sex addiction, and and people said, yeah. And so just like hearing these stories, I am seeing the behavior in the writer's room or with the executives that there has been some definite sex addiction type of behavior inappropriate talk and touching and things like that so yeah reading this vanity fair article uh i had shared with you mj that just after that came out that some of uh the podcasters that i've been following since 2005 back when i first got into listening to podcasts it was around the tv show lost and Mm -hmm. i'm friends with a number of them Uh, in fact one of them is um in the middle of making a documentary on lost called the, mm. the documentary is called getting lost. And he's mm. been interviewing a number of cast and crew and he put a pause on it and said that, you know, this article was just devastating and wanted to revisit it. And he's going to be redoing a lot of the interviews in the wake of this uh, article and book. But one of the the writers said that you know despite of how toxic the environment was behind the scenes he didn't want people to not love the art that they created he put a lot of time and effort into that and really wants the fans to be able to enjoy the show um mm-hmm. but that being said this podcaster turned documentarian did this wonderful streaming event with a number of fans of the show and fellow podcasters. Um, But they had this two hour conversation, uh, maybe two and a half hour conversation around their thoughts around this article. And Mm -hmm. it was great that it wasn't just a bunch of people just ignoring the issue. So they got to really talk about the issue of the racism and the sexism that, that happened and uh, what they hope can happen moving forward. And Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like 
he's going to be addressing this in the documentary uh, if as they continue. But right now they they've got like fifty hours worth of material to go through. But um, oh jeez, yeah, yeah. So uh, anyway, so when we were talking about things that that can be flawed that we can still have an appreciation for this one comes to mind for me i'm in the middle of or not middle i'm nearing the end of my journey on my seventh rewatch of the the show um following Mm. another podcast that (laughs) that's uh been doing this rewatch for a couple of years they took a about a year off during the pandemic they had multiple issues going on um, but they finally rejoined and re- started re-recording. And so we're in the middle of the last season right now. And mm-hmm. I still get a lot of um a lot of information out of it. And in fact, one of the emails that I'm going to read on this episode does talk about not being a fan of the TV show, but hearing the episode that you and I did. He mm-hmm. wants to revisit the show in the light of how we viewed it in terms of addiction and character defects and inherent flaws in humans. And yes. the, the fact that this TV show was able to to show flawed characters and having their their arc over a number of seasons to try to find redemption over some of those flaws. So... Mm-hmm. Yeah, it it's still a show that I can go to. So, anyway. yeah, I know the love. It's got to be challenging. Well, I appreciate bringing that up. I knew the book was coming out, but of course, it doesn't surprise me that there's a toxic and sexist and sexually exploitative environment there because that was so prevalent, ev- or it is so prevalent everywhere in yeah. Hollywood. Like, okay, I've just started re-watching Family Guy, which yeah. I hadn't seen since I was a kid, really. Mm-hmm. And I started back because I can't really watch anything serious if, you know, anyone has toddlers. I've been, I just need something that I can laugh at. And I still like it, but the casual racism, oh. <laughs> what I put, is, is just everywhere. So it's hard to watch it. And I think about how much you know, if it bums me out, it must just be crushing for other people. And that is the finished product that we're talking about. I mean, every episode. And so I've stopped watching it now because that actually got to me. So this is a little different than what you're saying. But yeah, yeah. But it's important too. And I think it also absolutely goes back to sex addiction. Because what you have are some of the most powerful people in America. And at that time, In my mind, you've been at this longer than I have, but it seems like sexual addiction and sexual compulsion wasn't even addressed. And if it was, to quote another film, I watch broadcast news. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that takes place in the 80s. And they were shocked. The women in in the newsroom were so appreciative of a story about date rape in the 1980s. Mm-hmm. There weren't law. Well, there were laws on the books, so it's like you have these really powerful, mostly white men making these choices, and I don't know. To me, it knowing what I know now about and just thinking about myself and sexual compulsion, mm-hmm. and I just feel like this evolution that we're a, a part of as a culture, you know, an evolution of inclusion. Part of it, I think, is a, a deep understanding of just how flawed and controlled men are by their sexualities and in the way that that defames, damages, and controls women and the way people don't want to put up with it anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I don't know. I think about this a lot because I'm leaving L.A. now. Mm-hmm. I'm going to Louisiana, and I didn't give anything up. I got close, you know. I had that one day when all the managers had written to me and wanted me, but then I sent my stuff and they, and I never heard back. And that's okay. I, I'm happy with getting that close, that close. I chased mm-hmm. my dream, and I'm still writing. But what I'm saying, Jason, is 
I think it's better. I feel spiritually better going to Louisiana and, you know, teaching freshmen mm -hmm. English and watching shows from different perspectives other than another white male, which would be me. Mm -hmm. and that, that doesn't mean I'm not going to write. You know, maybe I'll write and one day Kai will direct it and cut it with her own ideas. Yeah, yeah. But, but the thing is, I'm in favor of this change. I'm behind it. And sex addiction is going to be talked about more and more. You know, mm -hmm. it is. Because it just has to be. To me, it's a part of all this. And I guess that's what I was saying there. Go ahead. What yeah, yeah. I was going to say that right at the beginning, uh, and I addressed this at the workshop that I did in 2019, when mm -hmm. I was wondering if this would be a, a topic that we could bring up on the podcast, uh, the, the beginning of a lot of the hashtag me too stories and everything coming out, I was not surprised in the slightest. It's like, no. I've heard these stories of people finding right. the rooms and talking about their behavior. And I know that for me, before I got into the rooms, I had, I was just oblivious to how my behavior, how my language, um, my commentary, uh, sexually inappropriate wording, uh, I would always make sexual innuendos at parties and stuff that was mm -hmm. off-putting. And, you know, mm -hmm. I just had no clue that that was an issue. And once I started addressing it, it's like, oh, yeah. And so hearing the allegations is like, yep, that doesn't surprise me. This, the, uh, that doesn't surprise me. That doesn't surprise me. And especially when it comes to power, when, um, right. when an individual that has a lot of power can hold that over someone. Yes. And so, yeah, that is definitely talked about in the both the article and, and the book. It's been interesting for me to read as an addict in recovery, understanding the feelings and types of discovery that I've gone through um, in my own personal journey, that I can see that those types of rationalizations and, oh, it was just being playful, you know, um, just like not understanding how devastating that is for victims and being in this program has given me a lot of empathy for victims and part of my inner circle is voyeurism and so thinking about the victimization that i harmed had and done on uh, others that you know i'm not blameless in any of this right and there's one more thing about this that i think i'd like to say and I think about this too, though, and this is kind of the next step in it, you know, like we have people in the rooms who identify themselves as map. Yeah. Minor attracted persons. So my thinking on this is that the one place we're not at yet, but I think we will be soon. I think anyone can agree that it's horrible for children to have their innocence removed from me. You mm -hmm. know, I had it removed from me and it's it's horrible. So it can mess you up. It will mess you up for a long time and take a lot of work, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Okay, we all know this. But Jay, it's like this. I don't think that just shaming people and throwing them in the proverbial trash does any good. You know? Mm -hmm. It's like, <laughs> do you think the shame is going to stop who is doing and it doesn't have to be maps but i just said that because i heard of the person in texas the teacher who said it in class who said no 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 we shouldn't call people um they used a negative slur they should mm -hmm. said we should say maps and they were like kicked out of course it's texas so it's a little more conservative but they were like kicked out of their job but in 10 years or 20 years that's going to be hopefully normalized to use that kind of positive language, because I think long term, it's going to help damage fewer kids to have people know about recovery. Yeah. And, you know, people are going to feel shame 
Anyway, okay, there's this great show I like, Mr. In Between. Mm -hmm. And it's an amazing show on FX. And like every villain now, you know, is somebody who's trying to hurt a kid sexually. And of course, that's easy. To... But the thing is, I think we need to be able to move past that to the next level. And that is looking at treatment options and letting people know and working with people to get better and stopping mm -hmm. generational abuse. That's just yeah. my opinion because shame doesn't work. And you know, somebody's like, well, somebody said on a thread that I was on, well, we should chemically castrate. And I jumped right in there like I do. And I said, all you need to gamble is the will to gamble. <laughs> you know, you don't, you don't need money. Like we don't need any functioning equipment in order to hurt people. We just need the will to do it. The problem is in the mind. So I hope with all the, the next step in this is a move toward treatment instead of shame. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's just what I think. And I, and I even heard in our meeting, somebody coming in and I talked to them there too and shaming. And I got right out on there and said, you know, people are accepted here. And mm -hmm. It doesn't pisses me off. And I say that as someone who, you know, suffered abuse. And I just think that I have so much respect for people who come in. I have respect for all of us, but I have special respect for people who identify as math so much because they're risking the most, in my opinion. And they're societally viewed the way alcohol and drugs were way back when it started. Mm -hmm. And yet they're coming and they're going for it and they're trying to better their spirits. And think of how many people think of how many kids will live more freely because of that. And I really hope that type of energy spreads, you know? Anyway, I get kind of passionate about that. I'm sorry, Jay, if I went off on a tangent. I'm sorry. Yeah, and yeah, no problem. We were actually, uh, I spoke at a meeting last night um, mm -hmm. where I told my story and that it does involve child pornography. And some of the conversation that, that happened after was the fact that uh, I'm getting a couple things confused now, now that I think about it. I spoke at a meeting last night and the night uh, before I was a guest on uh, another podcast talking about destigmatizing sex addiction or um, sure. the focus of the podcast is being there for recovery of all types. And I was a guest to talk about destigmatizing sex addiction and talking about the views in the eyes of the public of what a sex addict is. I mean, we do have sex offenders, but not all sex addicts are sex offenders. But by being able to identify with some of the thoughts and behaviors can hopefully get people into recovery before anything bad happens and to stop the cycles. There's a lot of people that do follow that were abused as children and then they go from victim to perpetrator and right that if we can do what we can in this program to help stop that cycle it's an amazing thing but being able to talk about it is fucking difficult well it is and i should say one thing let me just say jay yeah. that i also as i've said on this podcast before you know i'm sure that i groomed people by the way that grooming is discussed now and i know that i expose myself on those like omegles and all that so yeah. i'm i have been also guilty of this and i just wanted to say that because i think as you said there are a lot of people who are and aren't sex offenders but we don't differentiate because most of us you know we've done similar things if we haven't done that you mm -hmm. know, we've done something else that was horrible and now we're working on it so anyway yeah you're... yeah i think just by having conversations like this <laughs> humanizing people that you know we're all going through a lot of difficult stuff with our relative right. addictions and so being able to have a place like the rooms of sex addicts anonymous where we can talk about that and we do have the specialized matter attracted person meetings to allow mm -hmm. for more open discussion around that because it, it can be uncomfortable for other people uh it can also right. be very uncomfortable to open oneself up 
I remember the first time that I talked about it in one of our meetings and I was just like, yeah, I don't know if I want to share this with the group. And, you know, I, I did. And the more that I was able to speak at meetings and speak here on the podcast about it, the less hesitant I am to speak up about it. And that gives a voice to others that are going through the same thing and hopefully that they can find recovery. Yes. Because if we're playing the long game, right. Mm -hmm. That's, that's how people are going to not be abused. Fewer people are going to be abused. If we're playing the long game is if everybody gets into recovery, the sun's going down behind me, as you can see. Yeah. Anyway, I appreciate you letting me come talk with you again. Yeah. Yeah. This is brilliant. And the fact that you're getting exercise and you're getting to spend time you know, walking your daughter here. So yeah. that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I hope she hears this one day. Kai, it was very hot and I walked you three times a day. Okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You loved it. She does. She sings to herself and talks to herself. Now I was hoping today that I could close this as I sometimes do our phone calls. Yeah. As I sometimes have, with a little serenade of you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, by all means. Okay, now we talked about Tom Morello. Uh huh. And I think it would be nice to do a little famous bit from one of his songs, but I'm going to do it in a little bit different way than it's been done. Okay. Sure. And I'm going to sing it. Okay. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. Fuck you, I won't do what you tell me. Fuck you, I won't do what you tell me. Killing in the name of. Killing in the name of. Killing in the name of. Okay, I'm getting lost. That's all I have for you. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you for being my sponsor and my. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, thank you for being a friend of the pod and being able to jump on whenever I need a guest. It's been Mm -hmm. an awesome, awesome gift. You know it, man. And I'm here anytime, but I'll probably see you if our pattern continues around episode 135. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Have a great night. All right. You too. I will see you later. Fuck you. I won't do what you tell me. Uh, many thanks to MJ for joining us and yeah, definite friend of the pod and happy to have him on in 30 or 40 episodes from now. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he did talk about the music of Tom Morello and rage against the machine. And a lot of our conversations will end with him doing a silly serenade like that. And it reminded me playfully of a uh, lounge singer and comedian, Richard Cheese. He did a fun version of Killing in the Name and wanted to play a little bit of that here. Fuck you, I won't do what you tell me. Fuck you, I won't do what you tell me. Fuck you, I won't do what you tell me. Fuck you, I won't do what you tell me. Fuck you, I won't do what you tell me. Fuck you, I will not do what you tell me. So fun. But yeah, Tom Morello, he is such an innovative guitar player and comes up with various ways of making tripped up sounds and things just from the guitar. So it's not typical guitar playing. He'll often imitate record scratching like a DJ for the hip hop elements of Rage Against the Machine. I first saw Rage open for Public Enemy back in uh, 92. And not a lot of people knew who Rage was at that point. And we were absolutely floored by the sounds that he was making out of that guitar. And like I mentioned, I will be playing some recovery-related music as it relates to some listener feedback. Uh, Anyway, I did want to play a little bit of a clip from the song called Know Your Enemy. And this does feature Maynard from Tool. Tom Morello and Adam Jones, the guitarist from Tool, were high school friends, and uh, there's been a close link between the two bands over the years. This also features the drummer from Jane's Addiction playing a little bit of percussive elements before going into the innovative guitar solo, so I wanted to play a little bit of that here.
yeah, yeah, absolutely love Rage, and I love playing a lot of Rage on my guitar, and very, very cool. So with that, I want to turn it over to listener email, and wow, yeah, we got uh, a lot over the past week or so. This one is titled Partner of a PA slash SA, Porn Addict or Sex Addict. I just wanted to reach out and tell you guys how grateful I am for your podcast. My partner and I have had multiple discovery days. We've been together three years. My support groups for betrayed individuals tell me to leave, that we aren't married, and the chances of failure are high, so I should just go. Anyway, I'm still here. The D days look different. Some were dating apps, some were sexting, discovery of porn and admission of a problem, followed by therapy for it, seeing the harm caused and quitting. These were all claimed, but were lies. This most recent discovery of a certain website uh, and the thousands of dollars he spent there buying content, having conversations, sending photos of himself, he tried to lie his way out of it and said, well, I did stop porn. This is different. We all know it's still porn, if not slightly worse. I finally cornered him into admitting that he was masturbating in the gym bathroom every time we went, which was six days a week. This experience has been incredibly painful for me, and I imagine the hurt is going to continue for a long time. His recovery efforts have been very casual, but not prioritized, and I feel like I'm having to remind him about it half of the time. Our best days are days I pretend nothing's wrong, and our worst days are when I ask him for reassurance or even breathe a word of the topic. He recently found your podcast, which has been incredibly beneficial. I got some books to read, but he's dyslexic, so even with his best effort, they are a challenge and not very efficient. Since discovering the podcast, he's gotten to episode 7 in about a two-week period. He's been looking into meetings. He took the assessment and says he's scared that maybe one day he escalates to other behaviors. While I know it'll be some time before we know if he's serious about recovery and staying sober, the podcast has been a tremendous tool in him inching his way forward on his journey, which in turn has helped give me hope. Thank you for creating this resource, and congratulations on building the strength, courage, and fortitude to support your sobriety. Signed, S. Yeah, very, very touching email. Thank you so much for writing in. And like I had mentioned on a previous episode that I got an email from someone in COSA, and we have shared a lot of COSA stories. And I will be scheduling some conversational interviews with some COSA members very soon, uh, hopefully in August. But yeah, usually we've been playing recordings from a COSA and SAA speaker meeting to hear those types of stories. And for anyone listening, COSA is a program for people whose lives have been affected by sex addiction. So it could be a partner, it could be a family member, it could be a friend, or even an addict themselves. Anyway, yeah, I wish you all the luck and hope that the podcast does some help and he finds the rooms of SAA and the path of recovery. Thank you so much. In this next one, I actually got a few emails from him. And this is from listener whose initial is B. Hi, Jason. I started listening to the podcast in June with the David K. episode. I was so enamored with the content that I decided to go all the way back to the beginning with episode one. I just finished episode 18, Lost in Recovery. Admittedly, I'm not a fan of Lost, but I think I will watch again with the recovery lens this time. I started working the program in March of 2019 and have found four years of sobriety this past June. There is so much in the podcast that I'm gaining. I'm hoping to visit a Bay Area meeting sometime soon via Zoom. And I have so many questions for you, but too many to put in this email. So I'll just start with this. In episode 17, LJ talks about a sponsee checklist. Is that available somewhere? Thanks, B. And yes, that is available. And I forwarded that email over to LJ. And he does have a lot of recovery resources available. And so anytime people ask for stuff that he talked about, I forward that email over to him. And so, yeah, hopefully he gets back to you. I know he's um, been really busy lately. 
but hopefully he can help there. And yeah, I did want to touch on this episode because MJ and I, we were the ones talking about the TV show Lost. And yeah, if you do happen to rewatch the show with the lens of recovery, uh, it's such an amazing gift. That's one of the reasons why I keep returning to watch the show. And uh, I wanted to read his second email before moving on to others. Uh, Hi, Jason. This is B again, the guy who is listening to the podcast from its inception. I'm currently on episode number 26. And you mentioned something about having a large group and there are too many to do individual introductions. And yeah, I'll stop here. Yeah, uh, our noon group, we do what's called the chaos method of introductions where everyone just shouts out their name and uh, why they're here. And it has just become a fun tradition in that meeting. A lot of people get a lot out of it instead of going around the room. And I will continue that thought here in a sec. Going back to the email, here is a suggestion. And forgive me if it has already been thought of. At one of the meetings I regularly attend, we have up to 30 people on the meeting. We hold five-minute breakout rooms after the opening of the meeting. The secretary slash host uses Zoom to randomly assign everyone to breakout rooms of three people. Then in the breakout room, each person takes a moment to check in, qualify as a sex addict, and announce any milestones. Many people say it's the best part of the meeting. We usually do not allow new people into the meeting after that point either. And that helps to keep everyone focused. Hope this was helpful. B. Yeah, that is really, really cool. I love the fact that many different groups are trying out different things. Uh, this noon group, we tried out lots of different ways of addressing milestones, newcomer introductions, general introductions, shares, etc., that meeting currently has um, roughly 85 to 120 people on. And what we've actually done is, uh, like I mentioned, we do the chaos method of introductions. Uh, we do celebrate newcomers and milestones. And then we have a reader who will focus on a topic. And then we go into a couple of different breakout rooms, usually three or four, that allows uh, everyone to share on the topic. But yeah, since that meeting has gotten really, really large, doing something like a uh, breakout room of three people would be really, really difficult. But yeah, we tried a lot of different things as our meetings were growing from the size of 30 to 40 to 50 or 60, and now having to shift that into 80 to 100 And so we find things that work. Uh, Some of them stick, some of them don't. And then we try new things. So yeah, I'm happy to get that message out to uh, other groups if they want to try something out like that. Thank you so much for writing in. And yeah, I will be responding to this as well. And I did give a link out to that noon group to be and I hope he's able to make it to that one but I also have other links to Bay Area meetings that are still on Zoom. A lot of our meetings have gone back in person but some of our meetings were set up at hospitals and those meetings are currently not able to get a room back at the hospital where they originally started so they're having to look for new avenues to find a meeting location but some of them have chosen to stay online permanently so we have a good mixture here in the bay area of in-person versus zoom and i'd be happy to get that information over to you and yeah i did get a couple of other emails around finding meetings here in the bay area and i'm not going to read those out here on the uh, podcast but i'm happy to help other people with that So the next two that I wanted to read cover music. And just thinking of that, I know that there was one that I got a few months ago where someone had some music recommendations for the podcast and I hadn't had time to squeeze those in. So I'm going to look back for that. And in looking for that email, I found that there were a few from April and May that I did not get a chance to respond to or read here on the podcast. And so I will be getting to that on a future episode. And again, I apologize for that. I've been quite busy and keeping track of all of the emails coming in. 
has been a little bit of a difficult task, but I am really, really grateful for each and every email that we get. So keep them coming. Yeah, and look forward to those on probably episode 101. So just after I released episode 98, and that was the last one I did on throat singing, I got this wonderful email. It says, thank you for your deep dive into throat singing. I listened to this podcast while participating in a classical music festival in Italy. I am a pianist and composer and reluctant to admit sex addict. This was an amazing reminder of music that I had learned about in school, but your take on this music reminded me of the wonderful healing power of music, even music foreign into my ears, fingers, and mouth. Thank you again. This episode touched me in a surprising and profound way. I will be adding many of your examples to some playlists of mine for meditation and healing and for just rocking out too. Signed, A. Yeah, I'm... So grateful for that. I was kind of worried about doing an episode on throat singing, not not sure how it would connect with other sex addicts, but I did hear from a couple of people at my meetings that they really enjoyed it and liked this email. I'm really, really happy to have done that, and I'm glad that it, it helped you. I did want to talk about a couple things from episode 98. One, there was the mistake I talked about the horror movie, The Ring, but it was actually The Grudge, where the spooky kid made the vocal fry clicking noise. So I noticed that while I was editing the episode together, and it was just going to be too much of a hassle to re-record, so I thought I would make mention of that here on this episode. Additionally, there was a wonderful interview with Jonas Lorenzen, who was a former member of Heilung and his new project, uh, Nabala, and I played their music on the podcast, but I found a wonderful interview uh, a couple of years ago with him and him opening up about his fears and vulnerability. It just connected with me and it was very, very recovery related. And I was hoping to include that on that episode, but I edited so much into that episode that I completely forgot about it. So I wanted to play that little clip here. I also happened to find a really, really good therapist, but working with him has, you know, really allowed me because what a lot of what he does is like he says, okay, so you're feeling all these feelings and, and you're scared of this and you're scared of succeeding and you're um, <clears throat> having problems at home and all this kind of stuff. So, so feel it, yeah. be in it like fully. It's not dangerous. Yeah. None of these things are dangerous. Yeah. These things are just emotions. Yes. They're just stuff passing by and you don't have to act on all of it. You have to decide what emotion, what feeling, what thought is the captain on your ship. So this thing about taking a few minutes could just be a few minutes every day and just sitting down and, okay, what am I feeling right now? What am I actually feeling? What's actually going on? And then saying, okay, I'm feeling all these things, these things I'm feeling, I'm feeling this anger, I'm feeling this jealousy, I'm worried about what people think about me and so on and so forth. Okay, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. That's a part of you too. Mm. Don't go like, oh, I shouldn't be thinking like that. Or I shouldn't be like feeling that kind of stuff. Mm. Say, okay, that's fine. But do I like it when I feel that way? Do I like it when I get too immersed in what people think about me and so on? No. Okay, so maybe I shouldn't Mm. dwell on that too much. Maybe I should dwell on this thing instead of like thinking about what I want to do and what I want to create and so on. And then go with that. Yeah. So it's never about it's never about saying this is bad, this is this and all, all these different things. It's never about that. It's it's just about letting everything be mm-hmm. as it is. So yeah, I love love Jonas. Jonas or Jonas. Uh, he's a regular guest on another podcast that I listen to a lot. And he is also a part of several of the Facebook groups that I'm in. And so getting to hear from him is really really cool his sister emily or amelia is a current member of heilung and i will be playing some of amelia's music here on the podcast at some point she's also done some solo work but yeah so i mentioned just a quick reference in episode 98 the email that i had gotten right when i was in the middle of recording that episode It says, hi, Jason, this is Jay from Colorado. And after hearing about how music affects you in recovery, I made a playlist of my own. 
I wanted to share it because I thought you might find some th- songs helpful. They do have a Christian bend to them. Not much I can do about it. But some songs are very clearly talking about addiction. I'm currently trying to catch up to the current podcast and am on the upper 50s. So grateful for this and that it's on YouTube. My phone censors this in podcasts. Thanks, Jay. And then he sent a playlist through Apple Music. And the playlist does have over 100 songs. I'm only part of the way through the playlist, but uh, one of the bands, Skillet, I was aware of, and I have several of their songs, but wanted to play some of that here. a song called safe with you and that was a live version and thinking back all the way to episode nine where i was talking about my journey of finding a higher power through music i talked about how one of my program friends had gifted me a few songs through itunes one of those songs was oceans by hillsong united and i did play that song on episode nine but the other song was called awake and alive by skillet it really reminds me of the band evanescence so cool but yeah i totally want to hear more of their music as well so back to this recovery playlist another one was crowder i had not heard of before and it comes from david crowder uh, there's also a song in there from the david crowder band but yeah i was really really digging on this this is a song called higher power by crowder My people, Sunday morning. They- Man, that is so awesome. And yeah, I've been really digging on a few of their songs and we'll be playing more of them soon. Also among the playlists, and I will play some of the other songs on a future episode, the band Thousand Foot Crutch. And there are a few other worship bands in there, uh, New Life Worship and Zealand Worship. Also included are For King and Country, Elevation Worship, John Egan, Cutlass, Lauren Daigle. Yeah, so there's a lot of stuff. Most of the music comes from Thousand Foot Crutch, Skillet, For King and Country, and Crowder. And so, yeah, I will be listening to those, and as some of those jump out to me, I will be playing those on future episodes. But yeah, I did want to focus in on a couple of them here on this one. Beyond that, uh, as far as emails go, I've just been going back and forth with some of the COSA information, trying to get that scheduled. Uh, I do have the 100th episode scheduled to record on July 18th. And if anyone hears this before then, uh, this will be out just a few days before we're set to record. But the link is on the Bay Area SAA website under announcements and that will do it for emails this week and like i mentioned earlier as i was editing i found an email from may that had some music references that i was hoping to include here 
but seeing a few others from April and May that I have not read, I will include those on a future episode of the podcast. Also, I was planning to read some of Mo Ryan's article on Lost that MJ and I were talking about, and that article from Vanity Fair is called Lost Illusions, the untold story of the hit show's poisonous culture. And I also wanted to read some of her book called Burn It Down, Power, Complicity, and a Call for Change in Hollywood. But since the end of this episode was quite long, I will be leaving links to those in the show notes. And I will also be leaving links to a few of the standing meditation videos, similar to what MJ was describing, as well as links to the songs and YouTube videos used in this episode. Anyway, with all of that, I am going to close out this episode. So if you did want to get a hold of us and leave feedback for the podcast, you can reach us at feedback at sexaddictsrecoverypod.com. Feel free to leave any recovery-related music or things that you think might be worthy of playing here on the podcast. I'd be happy to include that. Uh, any feedback on specific episodes, no matter where you are in your podcast journey, and if you wanted to get a hold of me personally to ask questions about the program, schedule yourself as a guest, uh, you can reach me at jason at sexaddictsrecoverypod.com and I'd be happy to get back to you. I thank you so much for tuning in. And yeah, this is the last one before episode 100. And uh, it's such a, such a cool milestone. I'm really grateful to have made it this far. So... Thank you to everyone that listens. And as always, keep coming back. The views and opinions contained in the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the Bay Area Intergroup or the ISO of SAA. Killing in the name of Killing in the name of And now you do what they told ya And now you do what they told ya